So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar entitled Innovating Together for Better Health. I am Elizabeth Eisenhower. I am the Innovation Lead at Kingston Health Sciences Center. And the hospital, together with the Innovation Hub at St. Lawrence College and the Dun & Deshpande Queens Innovation Center, have organized this webinar, uh, the second one in a series, as part of the Health Innovation YGK initiative. The first webinar held in November of last year really focused on hospital needs and opportunities for innovation and the process by which novel technologies and tools could be introduced into a hospital setting. This time, the focus is quite different. We're going to be looking at our Frontenac, Lennox and Addington, Ontario Health team with two of the leaders uh, from the health team here today to walk you through how this partnered organization across our region is setting priorities, identifying needs, um, exploring uh, opportunities for innovation, and enlighten you about how you as um, interested members of the community could participate in the process. So with no further ado, I'd like to uh, move to the next slide and introduce, first of all, our esteemed um, MC, Dr. Jim McClellan, whom you may remember from our last webinar. He's the academic director of the DDQIC and former head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at Queen's University. And he will be providing you with uh, a bit of information about the goals of the day, uh, and some background and how to ask questions as well as managing the entire uh, forum. Dr. Kim Morrison is the executive lead of the Frontenac Lennox and Addington Ontario Health Team, family physician and chief of staff at LNA County General Hospital in Napanee. And Dr. Morrison will be giving you an overview of the FLA OHT, what it is, how it's working and what its priorities are. And finally, Dr. Daniel Glatt, we're pleased to have join us. He's co-chair of the digital support structure within the FLNA OHT. He also is a family physician and hospitalist at LNA County General Hospital. And he's going to really be focusing on some of the digital uh, projects, needs and opportunities that the OHT is working on. So with that as background, I'm going to pass the baton to Jim to set the stage for today. Thank you, Dr. Eisenhower. And uh, very pleased to be back <clears throat> and thrilled to see so many people uh, participating in this workshop. Um, if, to get started, what I'd like to do is just talk about a few housekeeping rules. So we are going to be recording this event. Just wanna make sure that everybody is aware of that and we'll be posting it uh, in a YouTube forum. Uh, a transcription will be available throughout the webinar. And if you could uh, pose questions and comments, uh, one of two ways, either use the chat, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat and, and coalescing and collecting uh, comments and questions, or use the raise hand feature during the question and answer period. Uh, then what we can do is uh, invite you to unmute and ask your question in person as well. Okay, but we'll be trying to pull together uh, various questions and comments in, in themes. Okay, and you're welcome to enter those comments or questions throughout the entire session as they rise in your head when you're looking at uh, parts of the presentation. I'd now like to move to land acknowledgement. And uh, with this deep respect and humility, we acknowledge that the Frontenac, Lennox, Nagington, Ontario Health Team is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat nations, as well as the territories of other rural and urban indigenous community members, including Métis, Inuit, and other First Peoples from across Turtle Island. We stand upon land that carries the footsteps of peoples of indigenous ancestry who have been here for thousands of years. We have an opportunity to learn from each other, to improve relationships and promote respect for the past, present, sorry, past, present, and future. We are thankful to share, learn, work, play, and grow on these lands as we work together to build a new healthcare system that will be inclusive and equal for all. And, uh, always very happy to see the trilliums come every spring as a reminder of rejuvenation. The goals for the session today 
uh, are three. One is uh, to learn how the Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington Ontario Health Team, which I'll refer to as the FLAOHT, is transforming the local healthcare system through innovation in digital health and integrated care models. To identify opportunities for innovators and entrepreneurs to collaborate with the FLAOHT on this transformation journey and to identify opportunities for innovation to address rural health challenges in particular. What I wanna do is just touch briefly on some workshops that we've been having that have been focused on rural health innovation. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm the academic director for the Dun & Deshpande Queen's Innovation Center, the DDQIC, it's quite a mouthful. And our mission is to catalyze creative potential develop entrepreneurial mindsets and foster a culture of innovation across Queen's University, the Kingston community and globally. So we're very much outward facing in the region. And in that spirit, we're part of the Health Innovation YGK initiative. If I can have the next slide, please. And as part of that, we have a couple of programs that we hope will be of interest to innovators and entrepreneurs interested in health innovation from across the region. First, we have Built to Scale Health, which creates distinctive value by addressing unmet needs in the health sector. And we support teams who want to develop innovative solutions in health products, technologies, and systems, services and delivery methods, and health policy. We also have the Grow Rural program, so Build to Scale Grow Rural, which is focused on specific opportunities and challenges of health in rural regions. And so DDQIC, with the help of Health Innovation YGK Partners, has hosted two kickoff panel events. The first was held in January, and we were very fortunate to have a, uh, a, a great panel, and we had uh, some great discussion. The, the YouTube video from that is available as well. Uh, we had Gary Oosterhoff, uh, counselor from Countryside District in the city of Kingston. Tracy Snow, who is Rural Economic and Community Development Manager with city of Kingston. Louise Moody, Executive Director of Rural Frontenac Community Services, based in Charbot Lake. Meredith Pricker, Nurse Lead, uh, Rural Kingston Health Family Organization, working out of Sydenham. And Claire Bouvier from Kingston Economic Development, who is a small business advisor. We followed that with a great fireside chat with David Townsend, who is Executive Director of South Frontenac Community Services. And he spoke about rural health innovation continuing, and the, the theme was continuing the conversation and talked about some of the work that's underway there. Which brings us to tonight's event. So the focus is Frontenac, Lennox and Addington, Ontario Health Team, which is serving the entire region. And what we're looking to do is to stimulate conversations and identify opportunities to innovate together for better health. And so in advancing innovation across Frontenac, Lennox and Addington. And so now what I would like to do is to hand over to Dr. Kim Morrison, who will lead the presentation on behalf of FLA OHT. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jim. And, and thanks everybody for coming tonight, taking time on a beautiful uh, spring evening to, to learn more about this. And the Ontario health teams are really uh, an opportunity. I, I'm not going to call it a gift from the government, um, but but it is an opportunity that that we haven't seen here before, where where we are being given the opportunity or the challenge <clears throat> um, to come together as partners um, in innovative ways um, to really look at is there a better way that we can deliver healthcare to the people that that live here um, by the people who provide care here. So this. Ontario Health Team is one of 51 across the province. And you'll see on the little map here, this is our attributable population or by the ministries speak, um, the patients and families and caregivers that, that we can put at the center of the system that we deliver. Um, and, in, and we're tasked with ensuring that, that regardless of where you live in this sort of oddly shaped rectangle, um, your healthcare needs can be addressed by this team that we build together. So. Um, as, as you've seen in these previous demonstrations, the rurality piece of the work that we do is, is really front and foremost. On the next slide, the, the OHT frames itself uh, in what's called the quadruple aim in healthcare. It's actually about to move to the quintuple aim, um, but it's focused on bringing partners together 
uh, to achieve four main outcomes. And, and the first is around the patient experience. Um, how do people feel about the care that they delivered? Is it meeting their needs? Um, it's about improving population health. So as opposed to focusing on, on a very specific disease, we, we have to take a step back and if we're gonna make a difference or a change in the way that, that we achieve the health outcomes that we're hoping for, we have to take a population health approach to this. We have to think about ways to prevent disease and care for it better in its early stage and, and really an upstream approach to, to health and wellness and away from the medical model and the silos that currently exist in the way our system is designed. In order to do this, it's important to, to be aware of the care team and ensure that their needs are met. I mean, it doesn't really work very well if, if we don't have the human health resources desired to, um, to, to meet the needs of our community and provide the service that we know is needed. And in and amongst all of this, we, we have to be mindful that there are finite resources in healthcare. There are lots of resources, but they are finite. And it behooves us all to ensure that the systems that we build and design together um, focus on accountability and achieving the best value for the resources input. On the next slide, this is a little bit about what our OHT population looks like. Uh, we know that we are predominantly more rural and older than the rest of the province. You probably are all very aware of that. Um, our population, 21% of us are over 53, which I thought was an interesting, pretty low cutoff. But anyways, it is what it is. That's what the census data shows us. The, we know that we don't have the same access to palliative care as other parts of the province. We know that a vast majority, seven, that number is probably even lower than it truly is, don't have access to a family doctor or a primary care practitioner and a nurse practitioner. And that's really the foundation of, of healthcare systems around the world that are high functioning. We know that our mental health care needs in our population are higher than the provincial average. Our Indigenous population, which has its own set of, of wellness and equity and cultural principles that are, that are important that we, they, we pay attention to and include in our healthcare system is higher than the rest of the province. And we know that we have a large French language population who, who needs their services delivered in a way that's, that's accessible to them and meaningful to them. And, and we can ensure that all people in our, <clears throat> sorry, our attributable population get access to the care that they need. On the next slide, when we first came together um, <clears throat> as an OHT to put in an application to the ministry, we were, we were tasked with identifying the priorities that we wanted to address first. This by no means means that there's aren't other priorities, but we have to focus our efforts on, on, the, on what was most important to us um, and then be able to build our team around that. And we can use these examples and I'll talk about the projects in a minute. Um, on, on what a team really looks like. How can we collaborate better? How can we design better systems? How can we innovate? How can we uh, trial new things um, using these examples? So our, our four priority populations were the adults who are at risk for prolonged hospitalization or long-term care admission where really what they would want most is to stay at home, um, surrounded by the people that they know and the things that they love. And so our project around this one is, is geared at supporting patients to stay and live comfortably at home, but recognizing also that reducing the stress on their caregivers is an essential element to, to being able to achieve this. Another population was those people who are transitioning between hospital and home, recognizing that uh, this is a, a, a vulnerable time for people. And especially if you don't have a primary care provider, what does that look like for you? But even if you do, how are we ensuring that we're communicating or collaborating and the right information is in the right place at the right time so that the reduced, there's a reduced risk of returning to hospital or an emergency department or getting your medications mixed up um, if we had a better system around how that happened. In our population around mental health and addictions, <clears throat> We recognize that there are a large number of really great organizations who try to meet the needs of this population. Um, but in silos, it's hard to know where to go when. So this work group is really tasked with bringing the providers together and, and creating the, the space and opportunity for them to meet with their primary care doctors and, and really match resources to patients' needs. And so you can have sort of four organizations sitting around your table and you say, you know, this particular person is in need of this service. And instead of sort of 
throwing things out and seeing where it lands, you can have that conversation right there with the care providers about, you know what, my agency can help do this and I can connect to that agency and really keep people together and coordinated in a collaborative way. The final group recognizing that our area does not have the same access to palliative care as the rest of the province was really focused on building a team um, around providing high quality palliative care and partnering with primary care to ensure that they're empowered to do what they can do, but yet they have access to the specialty care needs um, when the needs arise as people are, are coming towards their end of life. <clears throat> All of this model on the next slide um, speaks about the concept of a, of a health home and a health neighborhood. And I'll talk a little bit more about the health home on the next slide, but this is just a graphic to, to really recognize that people themselves provide the vast majority of the care that they need to stay well and healthy. If somebody is, is not participating in their care, their outcomes just aren't going to be the same. The next group of people around that are their family and their caregivers and their, um, their closest relatives who help support them in their home. And that's at the nidus of, of this health home. Health in our, in our system has to be people-centered. It can't be about the systems that support people. It has to be about the people who, who seek care and, and in our population that we aim to, to co-design their care together with. The health home is that, that group of, of providers based in primary care um, who help support people in their homes. The health neighborhood are those other agencies and partners and services that, that people need to know exist you need to know how to, to be able to connect with them. You have to have a seamless way to, to access care, um, but you don't need them every day. I, I liken that to like a high-end restaurant. You know, you, you can't go to a high-end restaurant every day, but it's really nice to know where the one is in your neighborhood, but you need access to basic groceries every single day. And those need to be in your health home. And the high-end restaurant can be in the neighborhood. <clears throat> On the next slide, we, we took the Health Home um, Foundation and we applied it to these priority projects. If we go to the next slide, we spent a lot of time speaking about um, what the principles were of, of a people-centered health home. So if we're going to focus on, on keeping people well in their homes, these are the seven principles that through engagement with our partners and our community members, we landed on to, to help us really build that foundation of what a health home could be. It's important to recognize that a health home is going to be slightly different for different people, but the principles should be the same. The services that you might need in your health home may be different depending on whether you live in, in North Cloyne, especially this weekend, um, or if you live in downtown Kingston, or you don't have a home. Um, <clears throat> but the principles are the same. And, and these are the seven principles that you see here on the slide. It, it really speaks to the need to, to be holistic and to be equitable. <clears throat> Excuse me, choking here. Um, and, and as we go through these, it's important that the Ontario Health Team and, and hopefully through communications like this one with our community, um, we think about what the opportunities are for innovation in each of these seven elements. How do we ensure that we're holistic, that we in, are encompassing the social determinants of health and the basic needs of people when we think about their health and their wellness? How do we ensure that we have equitable access to these, these health homes? How do we ensure that everybody who wants one has access to a health home in our community? When you move to Kingston, you're not on a waiting list for school. You get to go to school, but you know, you don't get a family doctor and there's, there's gotta be better ways to work at the way that we deliver care in order to ensure that we have equitable access. It's important that our, our healthcare system is connected. And Dr. Glatt's gonna tell you some more about some of the connection pieces that we're working on and, and we seek your ideas on other ways to achieve that. It has to be collaborative. There's a myriad of partners that all together care better for a person than in any individual in a silo can do on their own. <clears throat> the health homes have to be continuous. It shouldn't matter where you are in your healthcare journey, cradle to grave, in the middle of, a, of a, some kind of medical crisis versus a social crisis, your health home needs to be able to meet your needs anywhere in your care journey. And finally, we can't 
we can't ignore the piece about accountability. In order for a system to be sustainable, in order for it to carry forward and be able to deliver on its mission, there has to be accountability. And we have to have meaningful ways to, to understand that accountability and make sure that we hold people to that where everybody can do their part. And if we do it together, we just know it's going to be better than individual silos that currently exist. So this is a, a next slide. This is a pretty high level overview of the work of the Ontario Health Team to date. Um, we've just reached the end of our year one journey um, and are starting into year two. There is a very long <clears throat> year one report that was submitted to the ministry and is available on our website, website if you're interested in all the details. It's about 45 pages of the work that we've done. And we're obviously not going to touch on, on most of that here. Um, but where we are now is, is reaching out into our community at meetings like this um, and with other parts of our community members to really understand where, we're, where we are and where we're going and that we have the community coming along with us. This is truly um, a, an opportunity, as I said, from the ministry to co-design this system, become a learning health system and be able to scale and spread our learning. So um, we're in the middle of our strategic plan engagement. Um, these are the, the ways that you can contribute right now to, um, to our, our engagement um, activities. There's a survey, there's a share your story. Um, you can go to our website to get all of that information. And what I'd like to do now is share with you um, through Dr. Glatt's work, the pieces of, of connectivity we're doing through the Health Home Foundation um, in our digital realm. And he's our co-chair of our, of our digital support structure. So with no further ado, uh, Dr. Glatt. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so the, the main kind of digital part that we're talking about is the work we're doing. And then more importantly, we wanna hear from all of you of ways that we can innovate and bring innovation uh, to the work we're doing. So the group that I co-chair, um, the digital support group is currently looking at the current landscape of digital health. Uh, in our region and looking at what is needed by our partners and our community to improve healthcare delivery. And we're actually pursuing funding opportunities to enhance digital support for both providers and individuals. Um, as Dr. Morrison talked about in a people-centered health home, being able to access one's healthcare information and resources 24 seven is crucial uh, for all of us have the best possible healthcare experiences. As the digital health support structure, um, we're trying to streamline all the various digital systems and processes to best serve all of us, with the ultimate goal of hopefully having one patient and one chart um, so that your health record follows you at all places of your health home. Uh, for community members, providers, and system leaders, this means that uh, the goal is to have one electronic medical record across the whole HT to improve communication between clinicians and providers. Um, to allow seamless transition, uh, accessible consultation, simplified referral processes, and improved interprofessional relationships, and of course, allowing patients to access their health information more easily than our current structure. Uh, this will improve care by allowing us all to work with the same set of information uh, as opposed to the silos that currently exist. Uh, one way that we're hoping to uh, eventually reach this vision is looking at a broad-based EMR adoption and a system change approach to reach this goal. Uh, next slide, please. So right now, there, there are many ways and opportunities that we uh, can achieve this. And digital solutions are just one tool to solve some of the issues around access equity, providing a infrastructure that is common amongst all providers uh, and to improve access. The hope is that digital tools that we implement will reduce and simplify the healthcare journey for both people and providers. Next slide, please. When we look at our healthcare system overall, um, we can kind of divide the way information flows into these four broad categories. These connection points and variation sharing methods would be simplified under one patient record. Um, but until then, uh, digital innovations can be used to improve our current processes. When we look at these four domains, uh, we are talking about things like provider-provider communication. This would include things such as referrals and consults, 
provider to community, such as home care referral, long-term care referral, community, uh, setting up community supports for patients, person provider uh, solutions, such as appointment booking, and finally, person community. Again, uh, this could look at projects like service navigation, how to access our system, and home supports. If we go to the next slide, we'll look at some of the current projects that fall under these four categories. Um, the first one uh, we can talk about is e-referral and e-consult expansion. E-referral is an online system where primary care providers and the providers can ask questions as specialists uh, digitally, attach documents, pictures, et cetera, and get a response back digitally. And it shortens the wait time uh, to get expert advice. And most questions can be then managed by the primary care provider. The program that we're doing with uh, uh, the kind of companion to that, sorry, that was, um, I misspoke, that was our e-consult, not the e-referral. Um, whereas the e-referral is an online system to try and streamline and centralize referral processes. So you send a referral to a department, uh, say, gynecology rather than individual providers. For the e-consult pilot project, uh, we are working with the Queen's Department of Family Medicine to take the back end and min work of that e-referral, uh, sorry, e-consult rather process um, by having a referral clerk that we can streamline that process. And we're hoping that all providers in our region will be able to have access to that admin support to make the e-consult process more seamless. Another project that we're working on in our region is online appointment booking. Uh, this is a joint project between Lark, Leeds, and Granville OHG and FLA OHG. Currently, we have 28 primary care providers in these regions testing the efficiency and utility of online booking appointments, um, which obviously will improve patients' access to care, but they don't have to make appointments tied to a secretary's schedule or office hours. Finally, uh, under patient community, uh, we are working on 24-7 healthcare navigation tool. Um, and the FLA OHT has been engaging partners and stakeholders to gather information, develop a plan for approving navigation and referral processes. We're working closely with Ontario Health uh, to see a provincial-wide benefit. Next slide, please. Amongst all this exciting work and that we're doing, you know, there are still a number of challenges that we're hoping to get help with. Um, some may involve digital aspects, but many others are system-wide looking at processes and how we work as a team of providers and patients. When exploring our digital innovation and further opportunities, privacy and legal considerations are uh, very important given the sensitive nature of the work we do and laws like public, uh, around uh, health information. As Dr. Morrison mentioned earlier, when we look at the seven health home principles of holistic, equitable, continuous, connected, accessible, collaborative, and accountable care, um, each of those have unique challenges that have opportunities for innovation. Some of the specific problems, uh, one is our system is currently quite fragmented. It can cause a plethora of solutions such as online appointment booking. There are six or seven major solutions available. Uh, getting physicians and other healthcare providers and patients adopt new technologies can be difficult. There is a cost to all these products and for many things, uh, it falls on individual providers or small groups of providers to fund these innovations. And we wanna ensure that anything we adopt as a larger collective is in alignment with the needs of Ontario Health and the expectations of Ontario Health, and ideally coordinated with our neighboring OHTs so we can deliver the best care to the Ontario East region. So at this point, I'm gonna pass things back to Dr. Morrison uh, to take us to the next steps, and then we'll be opening up discussion with all of you very shortly. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Glatt. And, and I hope uh, you all have a, an idea of the breadth of the digital innovation work that, that we've begun in the, in the Ontario Health Team. Um, we know there's a lot of work ahead and, and we can't do it alone. We have to do it in partnerships and collaboration. 
And, and I'm hopeful that the, the message that we're here to share and talk about today is, is how we can do that better together. How can we build a connected healthcare system um, focused on, on people at the center? Um, how can we develop the health home model that will meet the needs of people where they are at, not necessarily where the system currently exists and, and how can we keep it people-centered? Um, all seven of those principles, and I'm going to say them again because they're just so important to all the work that we've, that we've done. And, and can we think about ways that um, holistic well-being and equitable access to care and connected care, collaborative care, continuous care, um, and let's not forget the accountable piece, um, those principles at the foundation of the health home, digital strategies are one way to address it. But And we're hoping that in this community of innovators, we can consider some other ideas that can help fill the gaps that we have towards building this better system. So back to you, Jim. Happy Thank you very much, Doc. Thanks very much, Dr. Morrison. Um, this brings us now to the discussion. And so to get started, and I see that we've got one uh, one. Uh, question in the the chat, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so, what ideas does the work or do the work of the FLA OHT inspire about opportunities for collaboration? What are you working on that can accelerate the progress in any of the areas the FLA OHT is working on? And what innovative ideas can we develop together to build a better healthcare system? And before we get into the discussion, um, these slides will be available as well. But uh, if you could, if you have ideas that you want to share, um, what we do is ask you to also reach out to Ali Summers at the uh, at KCHC or at the health team, and she can then get you connected about opportunities for innovation. So we'll come back to that later on. But as you start having ideas and say, well, how do I get connected to the FLAOHT? Ali is going to be the, the contact point for that. And then she can help get you connected to people that, uh, that can work with you further. Okay. So to get started, um, I'm gonna, there's a question in the chat. And so the, the question is the home care and home care end use segment of the wearables market grew significantly in 2020, reflecting a preference for self-administration that was growing even before the pandemic. For instance, ultra volume wearable drug delivery for some chronic diseases like cancer, diabetes, developing a new medical device needs to have a clinical trial. How can FLA OHT help in this regard? So if I understand correctly, and Amir, please feel free to, to add, um, part of what you're looking at is as, you know, if we come up with device solutions, for example, or wearables, are there opportunities to do some of the necessary trials? working with FLA OHT. Who would like to, from, from FLA OHT, who, anybody like to, to pick that one up to start? I can try that one if you'd like. Please. Um, so, so excellent question. And, and I think the OHT is, is the, a great learning health system that can do those trials by, by considering all of the work we do from that quadruple aim, when we, we have a priority population or a population need to be addressed. So for example, your example of um, a, a diabetic who needs more intensive monitoring of their sugars. And if we use the health home model and we have the outcome of, of you know, less hospitalizations or better metrics of your diabetes management or less frequent visits to the emergency department, um, higher quality of life, patient experience measures, you can pick your evaluation. And the inputs we put in are a better way to deliver your medication, your insulin, or a better way to measure your sugars. And all of the, that information can be embedded within the health home where you co-design your care with your provider so that you have the information as the patient and your providers. And together through digital technologies, you can all be on top of that with less lab works. You can very well, I think, develop a framework of a project that would be designed to demonstrate those endpoints using the partners that are involved in the OHT. So you could include your primary care providers, you could include your specialist from the hospital, you could include your emergency department, you could include your lab, and you could include your pharmacy. It's an excellent, it's an excellent example. Thank you. Any follow-up uh, questions to that? Oh, okay. Okay, and I see that uh, most, of, is there any plan to incorporate any digital mental health solutions in FLA OHT services? Me again? <laughs> the, um, Please. 
<laughs> so so our, our year one project, as I described it, was around taking the existing service providers and bringing them to the health home and creating a platform where people could have that conversation. Our year two um, vision for our, for our addictions and mental health population is around access. And so having, having a way to ensure that we know what all of the available supports are to people, which include... Um, digital solutions, online support solutions, self-management support, you said group work, all of those things in an inventory are only so good if people know that they're there. So within the Ontario Health Team, hopefully in our ability to reach across partners allows those communication pathways of awareness of services and bringing them together so that you know, you've got a, an up-to-date inventory of, you know, this is my need, my care providers are helping me, and this is the, these are the resources that I can access. And it's connected in a way that that information can be shared back and forth so the person doesn't have to continually repeat their story. Thank you. Um, Alan Katz asks and says, hi, Dr. Morrison. Um, is there room for non-digital innovation suggestions? And if so, is there a separate funding stream for non-digital innovation projects from the Ministry of Health or Ontario Health? Well, um, we're talking about the ministry, first of all. So being respectful to start with, um, the ministry is at the moment still in their their, their own silos. And, and we're working hard across the province to, to talk about not having funding silos. So right now, the ministry has test of change funding silos. They have specific funding for projects such as Dr. Glatt described about online appointment booking or patient portals. Um, they are though now expanding to, to different buckets. They're still calling them buckets because that's the way that works. Um, around clinical system transformation, which doesn't have to be a digital solution, can be a care delivery solution. One of the projects, um, our palliative care project, um, put in an application to the ministry around um, funding for a palliative care team, which doesn't currently exist in our area, but using information from across the province and around the world, we put together the business case from a, an, an OHT perspective amongst all the partners to ask the ministry to fund that particular type of, of team-based care. Um, some of our projects um, around, are, are currently around improving in the way home and community care services can be delivered. And so the proposal is we want, instead of having home and community care as an agency and family health teams as an agency, how about we put those two things together and they're funded together and they are accountable together, all of the pieces of the quadruple aim, but it, it's a different service provider method. And, and we're hoping that they will fund that. Um, at, at maturity, you know, we have to look at shared accountability and it will go hand in hand with shared funding. One of the things the OHT has been successful in, in working together with, with the city and Kingston Health Sciences and Addiction Mental Health is obtaining funding for the integrated care hub in Kingston. Um, and, and so those are opportunities and partnerships through the OHT, which aren't digital, um, that, that can help move forward the concepts of those health homes. So while much of the, the public public facing pieces are on digital. Certainly there's lots of service provision um, benefits too that we're hopeful that we'll be able to take advantage of. I see Elizabeth has her hand up. Yes, um, so, so Kim, I was just going to add to what you said a little bit that there's no generic innovation bucket for new models of care, new ways of um, deploying health human resources that um, runs as a thread through the OHTs, um, which would be nice to see. It would be nice to see the opportunity to say in our region, the biggest need is to find a, an evidence-based solution for um, how do we better deliver as you were pointing out palliative care services. So far, most of the opportunities for innovation funding has been very uh, focused on very specific types of issues or problems or technologies. I mean, even recently, um, you know, let's get uh, e-referral ramped up for our surgical wait lists as an opportunity, which was great, 
but e-referral, if it's going to be used, let's say in a region, can't just be focused on a single specialty for a single uh, reason. So I think that has been a, a bit of a challenge that the OHT, the hospital, that the health system as a whole has, has struggled with is that there are project funding, there's very focused funding, but there's no sort of 2% of all health budget is going to be looking at innovating better ways to work together, which is um, unfortunate, but it's how we've been living. Thank you. And I see that uh, Daniel has his hand up as well. No, the only other common addition to that is even within the funding buckets, they can sometimes be very restrictive. Uh, so for example, there's funding for new online appointment booking, but if you have a pre-existing system uh, and we're in a leader in that area, uh, you're not eligible for it. So um, hopefully uh, the ministry will be open to these changes as things develop uh, so that uh, we can continue to innovate more rapidly. Thank you. Perhaps I could just add to this too that that you know one of the things that that DDQIC for example can help with is you know small amounts of seed funding to get some things going if you have some some ideas for solutions, but also you know working with you to and 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 I would say you know other groups Queens Partnerships and Innovation for example, and and other groups in the region, but but also to help try to find other kinds of funding that could help you get some sort of a product or service offering off the ground, you know, which may, you know, I mean, it's a publicly funded system. So it can still, will still, you know, at some point, you know, more often than not connect with, with Ministry of Health, Ontario Health, but in terms of getting something going, doesn't have to be the only path forward. We can be helping with, with seed support and that kind of thing. So just put that, put that out there as well. Um, now, um, any other, it, it, just on this particular thread here, anybody else have any comments or questions? And then I'm gonna double back to uh, the, the question that Michelle Shen uh, put in the chat. So from, from uh, FLAOHT or, or from uh, uh, Elizabeth, any, any comments or thoughts any, that you'd like to add? No, nope. good, okay. Um, so now Michelle Gishen asks, is there a plan to incorporate any digital therapeutic nutrition and health solutions in FLAOHT uh, services? I'm going to have to ask what a digital therapeutic nutrition solution would be. Sorry. So, Michelle, would you like to uh, unmute <laughs> and uh, give some examples? <laughs> or I could take a guess. Yeah. I think there's a couple ways of looking at it. There's a lot of people that don't have family doctors that are seeking uh, nutrition counseling on an individual basis whose um, coverages are, it's their benefit packages are not covering the coverage for therapeutic nutrition. A good example is uh Someone goes to see their doctor, they don't belong to a family health team, they have uh, serious even IBS symptoms, they go to a health professional, a nutritionist or a dietitian, and they're paying out of pocket for things like this. And we talk about preventative health. Um, there, I think of TELUS Health. I'm right now creating a wellness program that's all digital, all online, that is focused on health prevention and therapeutic nutrition for things like heart health, diabetes. Um, and the component is a series of digital online university level courses that the average person could understand, but also providing people one-on-one -on -one consultations and ongoing um, ongoing services as required for somebody who's diabetic, something like that. Like diabetes education, perfect example. I love it. Now I totally understand what you're talking about. And, and I, that's ex exactly the example of, of some of these solutions and gaps that I was hoping we would have conversations about because you know, people's ability to self-manage is only as good as the resources that they get. Like Dr. Google, we all know, gets people into trouble. 
Um, but it also, though, creates pathways and information for people to try and, and you know, find out more about their own condition and, and be partners in their own care. So the more that we can build solutions like that into the foundational health home so that people have equitable, accessible abilities to reach that kind of information is exactly what we're talking about. Excellent idea. Excellent. Thank you. And Daniel, you have your hand up. Maybe add uh, to that. Yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Morrison. The other part of that is uh, the health navigation part, because there are some, while well, limited funded opportunities to speak with a dietitian, they're covered provincially. So the healthcare navigation would take things like that, existing programs, and also um, help patients find them if they don't have a primary care team connection right now as well. And maybe if I could just add to that, it would seem that, that you know, back to Dr. Google, you know, now more than ever, you know, trusted sources that you, you know, that are sort of closer to home in a sense, you know, figuratively and or literally, you know, um, that you can identify with, you know, so, so, you know, building both on a relationship that you have in a region, you know, the FLAOHT, um, but, but then also making readily accessible, you know, sort of reliable information because I, you know, since we were washing information and disinformation. Yeah, no, I, I, that, that, that sounds like a great idea. Um, so I think, uh, so what we'll do now is, is jump to Dan Henry's question. Um, as part of FLA OHT, do you have, or do you think there could be a need for customer journey maps or patient journey maps of some typical repetitive health experiences to look for possible process improvements? See, I, I think this is where health and business have their best intersection. I mean, in, in traditional primary care, and, and Daniel, maybe you'll correct me, um, most providers do not have time nor take time um, to do any of, of the type of marketing, customer journal mapping that, that Dan is describing to really understand the flow and the process through their own office, never mind through the system. And that's exactly that like healthcare providers themselves are terrible at. And that's where we need those partnerships um, to, to be able to bring those things together. Um, you know, higher end, not higher end, but larger institutions um, will invest in Kaizen activities or lean methodology or, or those, those, you know, well-defined processes for understanding process and efficiency. Um, but that doesn't exist in smaller agencies or smaller organizations, even primary care for the most part, small community agencies, there just aren't the resources to do that. But that's an example of where we work together as a system and as collaborators, we could find those resources and do that map from beginning to end and see where the benefits and redundancies exist at each step of the way. And to kind of to highlight, to go on or add to your point, uh, Dr. Morrison, one of the main issues is the siloing of our information, even to us as providers, often those journeys are opaque, right? I send off a referral, I don't necessarily know any more information the patient does uh, of when that's going to happen, right? So breaking down, improving the communication within the system, breaking down those silos allows that type of work to be done more easily because I think right now it'd be very challenging. Elizabeth, would you like to add to the points? Uh, sure. I, I, I wasn't sure, Dan, whether you were really talking about looking at um, ways to make the system function better or to provide tools to facilitate appropriate management of patients and they are not disconnected from each other. One of the things we're already working on with Kim and the Primary Care Physicians Council is to develop standard patient managed algorithms for common routine health problems that um, if they are referred to a specialist end up waiting a very long time to be seen. And so co-creating with primary care, a, a management algorithm for the primary care physician to follow in lieu of sending in a referral, reduces wait lists, brings the appropriate care and management right into the health home. 
and avoids the long waits that cause anxiety. So that's one solution we're already working on. We've done eight of these pathways so far. And when patients are now referred for a condition for which the pathway would be relevant, the primary care physician is provided with a link back to the pathway and we've got educational series and stuff around them. The other place where there is some work happening, it tends to be things that bring people frequently to the emergency room or frequently into hospital, looking at what's the root cause of 30 day readmissions, which is a, a measure that a lot of um, organizations look at for um, uh, as a place where improvements could be needed. And part of the challenge that presents itself there is getting the right data to understand what are the um, what are the variables that might predict somebody is likely to be readmitted in 30 days? And how can we intervene with technologies, with um, appointments, with phone calls to sort of nip it in the bud before they come back? And there's a lot of work going on in that space. I'm not sure if that was uh, part of what you were thinking about, but I wanted to mention those two things. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, I'm just checking to see whether, yeah, a bit of both says Dan, thank you. So, yeah, no, I think there's some very interesting work, uh, you know, sounds like underway, but also that, that some inter very interesting opportunities. Um, to carry on with the theme uh, of the holistic home health, um, Ellen McGarrity Shipley says, thank you for all your work on this. In the interests of moving towards a more holistic health home model of care, will social service organizations such as KCHC be included as a service that healthcare practitioners can refer patients to on the online platform? Who would like to? I can take that one if you'd like. Please. So, so Alan, certainly when, we, when we're flushing out and we're building out the, the health home, um, we build from it from existing knowledge and evidence and certainly the work that Kingston Community Health Centre does um, in terms of um, equity seeking populations and vulnerable populations um, are, are ways of delivering care that, that ideally is replicated in every health home. So it, it doesn't matter if you're a newcomer to the area, you should be able to access any of your health home, like whichever health home is going to be yours, kind of like your school, um, and be able to receive care in, in you know, culturally appropriate or, you know, trauma-informed or indigenously culturally sensitive, all of the sort of, um, you know, populations that we know we need um, to ensure have their healthcare needs met, language needs, those sorts of things across. And, and I think Kingston Community Health Center has a lot to teach many of our other existing primary care practices as we build them into what a health home truly should be. We're all at various different levels of maturity of, of what a health home could and should be. Um, then there are services that are delivered best by Kingston Community Health Center that in an ideal world, 100% are accessible by all. Um, and hopefully by using the health home model and, and that form of connection and collaboration, we can ensure those resources are, are ready for those who need them and not, not um, left unused because people don't know that they exist. So, I mean, Kingston Community Health Center is, is a significant partner in our, in our Ontario health team, They're our funding agency, um, and the employer of all of our, of our backbone support structures. So, so certainly they have a large role to play in, in the work that we're doing all, with all of our other partners. I don't know if that answers your question or whether there was something more specific in there that I missed. While well, we wait to see if, um, if Ellen adds anything more. Oh, no, no. Yeah, it adds anything more. Um, I think what I'm gonna do now is um, link to the, the question that Mary Myers uh, posed. And then Frank, we will double back to your, or, um, to your question about equipment tracking as well. So Mary Myers asked, curious about the intersections between some of the digital health innovations converging with access and equity. So the quintuple aim, thinking about barriers to digital platforms and lack of rural broadband and internet as well as access for people who are homeless, houseless, or are unable to afford devices and so forth. Assuming, are, so are there considerations being embedded into the innovation process for these endeavors? 
We would love to hear from the innovators about ways to breach these issues 100%. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I think one of the values of the Ontario Health Team and bringing people together are this has to be about more than just listing the problems that we know exist and, and hoping together um, as partners, we can come up with solutions and trial and test them. We're, we're not going to get it right the first time. Um, and we're going to learn from each piece that we do. But but having platforms such as this and, and the support of the Innovation Center and Queen's University and St. Lawrence and, and even our own practice, family practices who are willing to try, um, it, you know, we bring these, we bring these options and we test them. And we have a, a really robust evaluation framework. We call it Quest Quality Evaluation Education and Research, um, who helps us, you know, design this learning health system and, and, and build it better. Maybe I could just build on that, uh, Kim, and, and, and say that, that, you know, I think another thing to, that, that'll be helpful to think about is, um, you know, you could say, well, we'll design, for example, digitally based uh, innovations. And then at the same time, separately, people will be thinking about, you know, sort of widespread broadband provision. Um, but of course, there may be some particularly helpful and innovative solutions that arise from looking at the intersection of those. And, and what comes to mind, for example, is, you know, why in different jurisdictions, WhatsApp, for example, is used instead of standard texting, right? So, you know, there are solutions out there that take into account, um, you know, the availability or the constraints of different, for example, telecommunication technologies. Um, and, and so one of the things you can be doing is to say, you know, we have in mind um, a lot of digitally based health innovations. We know that, you know, there are challenges in terms of broadband access and things like that. So what interesting solutions can we do to bring that, you know, close that gap, right? Not saying that status quo with respect to broadband is what you want to live with for the rest of your life. On the other hand, you know, saying, you know, how can we expedite and, and really help these solutions to impact, you know, more readily? It, and so I just, I would put that out as sort of a, an additional thing for for the innovators on the call to uh, to think about, and I know I, I know this in telecommunications people on this uh, this call. So the charge is over to you. Um, okay. Uh, any other thoughts? I saw somebody maybe come in or not. Um, sorry, raise a hand. But uh, please. Okay, Amir. Hi. <clears throat> Good evening. I just want to add a comment uh, because I had an experience in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, uh, <clears throat> net, mobile uh, network, they provide the uh, healthcare services and providing the, also the very high internet for their uh, customers. That, be, that would be very interesting to be involved with the, for example, Bell or uh, Freedom over there in Canada that be involved with the, providing the high um, quality internet and uh, use their services or uh, for them they have a benefit and also for health that uh, we can leverage that high uh, 5g internet that all around the globe we have a different solution i can say so maybe we can be work with them and be uh, make them involved with this part as well thank you and uh sharam please I'm glad that uh, you're joining the conversation Thanks, Shane. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, uh, hosting of this event. And thank you, Dr. Marissa and Dr. Glad for your presentations today. I'm Sharam Youssefi. I'm a professor uh, of engineering at Queens and co-founder CEO of a company called Mesh Scheduling, which is based out of Kingston. Not sure if you heard of it. Have you heard of Mesh AI, Dr. Morrison, Dr. Glad? So we are at, uh, that's the problem. Uh, we are at KCHC. And KFLA, we're a platform, a clinician scheduling platform that is used by KFLA. Uh, we're parts of KCHC, we're Queens, um, uh, some of the units at Queens KGH, Hotel 2. Uh, what we do is basic clinician scheduling. And the question I have is that I've done a lot of research on, you know, now what is is quintuple of AIM. Um, and, you know, I think the, the idea of quadruple and quintuple is that probably we'd not deliver on that try. Uh, aspect of it, the three dimensions we had and we were constantly adding to it. So my question is that, how do you see from your perspective as leaders in local healthcare, the challenges with uh, physician well-being, provider well-being overall, and how we can optimize their time uh, 
through which we can then improve access to those who don't have access and also uh, reduce burnout and the stress that has become so you know, uh, epidemic for our clinician community. So uh, I can start, Kim, if you want. Thank so you. I, I think Thank that's you. a great question. Um, I think it's like, we often talk about the right care at the right time in our healthcare system. So one of the questions as we look at how we're gonna design the future of our healthcare system is how are we getting the right care and the right work by the right provider? So a lot of primary care, a lot of our time is taken by min work. So finding innovation, innovative solutions that allow offloading or efficiencies in that type of work frees up your primary care provider and other health providers to provide more care. Uh, on average, uh, though it will vary from study to study, for every hour of clinical time, you're spending one to two hours of a min time per patient. And a lot of that is hidden um, from the public and other people, right? You don't you only see our face-to-face -face hours and availability. You don't see all the work done in the background uh, outside of clinic time. So I think that's one of the key things is uh, as we develop a, a, a more unified system that things that don't need an MD, maybe they'll be redirected to an RPN or RN. Um, perhaps there'll be more min support or AI like you're describing that will Offload some of those, offload some of those admin burdens uh, from physicians and other healthcare providers. Thank you, Dan. Any follow-on comment questions? Okay, Jim, please. Uh, maybe a slightly different angle on the general problem, but is 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 there a potential to have a very patient centric solution that could be sort of piloted so that if a company were to develop a very secure electronic data record and a patient were so inclined could a patient collect their own their own records and then present them at the various points of the healthcare system versus trying to collect it along the way and, and join all the pieces at the different healthcare touch points. Because I mean, although everybody's delivering the same healthcare, my understanding is they're all on different IT system, different vendors, different ways of recording data. Some are on paper, some are, you know, electronic, et cetera, et cetera. Is there some way that if there were patients that were so inclined, could that ever be a tractable avenue to, to move forward? So I guess it, the related part of that question is, is it even possible for patients to collect all that information themselves if they wanted to have their own digital wallet to say, well, here's my entire medical file every time there's an interaction with the healthcare system? So, so at some places that, that is available, um, it's certainly not widespread adoption yet. The other part of it is information in our healthcare system is difficult to move both ways um, because of the siloing that you're describing. Um, the, one of the challenges is when information is uploaded, um, on both ways is that it can come out of date very quickly and it requires reconciliation with other information. Um, so it is certainly something that's really interesting and novel and, uh, something like Sunnybrook has a system that allows that type of upload from a patient end. Um, but it's not, it doesn't have widespread adoption yet in uh, the province. I think if I could just follow that up the, you know, I, I think it depends on your, on how much you're willing to in, in, believe in the vision of a single record. And, and in a single record, patients would have equal access to their record just as their health providers would. So the need to, to have it yourself would be less. And, and if, we, if we decide that, you know, as a society, that's what's really important, that, you know, people have access to their records when they need it, the people that are looking after them have access to their records. Um, it's a big investment into a, a single record, whether that's pieces together or whether it's actually one. And, um, you know, Ontario has been talking about this for, for 20 years, um, but other jurisdictions have done it. And, and, you know, it, it's possible. There just has to be the, the, 
the will to to invest to invest in that and and so i'm hopeful that we can we can get close at least within our our area and and then again be be in a, be innovators and then leading in the province about the way that it can be done when you say other jurisdictions, that's in Canada or other outside of Canada. Out well, I mean, I mean, well, I probably shouldn't use Newfoundland because they had that big data breach, right? But at least they have one record, right. right? Like all of their providers, their community agencies, their primary care, and their hospitals are on one record. Yeah, Privacy and security, of course, is an issue. <laughs> Similarly, in Alberta, most things go to my chart and are infinitely more accessible than than our current system in Ontario. Right. The more eggs in the basket, the safer the basket better be. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I see Elizabeth talking about 20 years ago, if there was a decision to do this, but you know, I guess 20 years ago would have been the best time, but is, is today still a good time? If there was ever the will to, to, to move on something like this. Now, um, now yeah. Go ahead. Now is a great time in our region because um, our hospital partners are all moving to one shared EMR, right? Um, so certainly in our region, there is uh, lots of opportunity to see that vision of one patient, one chart. Uh, if it was successful, I think would really improve uh, the experience for both providers and patients alike. Sorry, Jim, if I could just add one other question, if it's okay. Sure. I mean, is, it, is there a patient centric approach where, you know, somebody with, with private insurance, you know, a company with benefits, you, could you envision an argument that somebody's just going to live longer, be sick less if they have their own medical record? Is there a, a patient centric, even private payer approach that would have it make sense so that I guess the downside is maybe your insurance company would run it probably. And then they'd probably be able to see everything, which I guess people would be worried about for their insurability, et cetera. But, and just trying to understand who who's a stakeholder that would have enough interest in the game to really drive a, a, a change. Sorry. I, I don't, quite understand the question, but um, maybe I'll just make a comment and I'll make a move. The patient owns their record. We, we as healthcare providers are just a custodian of it. So any of my patients at any time can request their entire record uh, and you know, outside of some very limited reasons, we would provide it to them, um, either digitally or hard copy. Um, but again, there'd be a min fee usually to produce that type of thing, but, but a patient is always entitled to their own health information. Uh, the processes of getting it are um, often more complex than they should be at this point with technology. I don't know that answered your question, but. Yes, I, I guess I try and rephrase my question. I guess like there's, uh, uh, you know, different insurance carriers that will reward you for walking and taking steps, et cetera. You take that metaphor further, if you've got your whole, you know, medical record and you know what your blood pressure is, or if you know if you've got glaucoma and you can measure it regularly and manage it, that uh, you're going to cost the healthcare system a lot less, and you're probably going to live a lot longer. Or at least, you know, as, as a non-medical professional, that would be my thought. Imagine if you bring together what what Elizabeth was talking about about pathways, and you know, you showed up at Emerge and you've done all of these little pathway things first, and you've done all of that. You know, do you get priority access? Like, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking, you know, as, as we go through this, it's like, oh, that would be kind of cool. And, and how much could you save? Because you're quite right. If you do all of these things or you do preventative care, the insurance companies already know this, right? That's why the, you get the little thing that goes in your car. Um, they wouldn't do it if they didn't make money. So where, where is the, the piece in healthcare where it's all public dollars that we're spending, right? These are, these are finite resources. Um, to drive that. And I think your question was, who is that driver? Is it the politician? Is it the provider? Is it the patient? Is it, is it one of the tech companies who can say, you know, I can give you the system FLA OHT and I, you know, we will save you X number of dollars and this is what it's going to cost you. Is it going to be that private innovation that, that does that? And I think those are pretty cool opportunities. I would just sort of say that I think the the need isn't for, I mean, if you look at a medical record in the old days when it was all paper and now it's sort of half and half in most places, it could be multiple centimeters thick with narrative and reports and this and that. And the things that you need to really ensure patient care isn't the entirety of that volume. 
it's sort of um, the key information about the problem list, the current issues, the current medications, the current test results. Um, you don't really need to know in a 70 year old that they had a cesarean section when they were 20, perhaps. But I think that the problem with this notion of the medical record is it is, it is a life story of information. And really for decision-making in the ER, you don't need a million pages of medical record. You need the key relevant information today. And one of the challenges is to, to figure out how to pull the relevant bits for patients, for providers around the system. And yes, it will be great if we all had a single record, but you could still spend forever digging through it electronically or physically to get the bits of information that are most relevant. And I think that's one of the things some of these my chart things does. It really focuses on test results and consult notes and lab tests and imaging results. And I think that's people sort of likening it to a bank account. <laughs> a bank account is so simple compared to a medical record. And yet other countries have done it really well and they are able to mine the data. That's the other use of having a common record is that you can actually use health information to understand trends, to understand risks, to see who's at risk um, and to intervene appropriately. I'm not sure we're gonna come up with a solution here. I thought 15, 20 years ago, it would be great if everybody just had an electronic version of their current medication list. So when they go into Emerge, they could plug in the little USB to the port and see everything they're on and make decisions appropriately because Frankly, a meds list tells you an awful lot about what's wrong with a person that's pre-existing. So, but we're still not even there. Thanks, thanks, Elizabeth. I, some fascinating ideas coming out here. Okay, and in terms of sort of structured, you know, like data mining and modeling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, linkages. So, um, I'm going to jump to Frank's question. Um, and so Frank uh, says, I'm working with KGH to evolve my system that they are currently using to track healthcare equipment use for a specialized patient pool across the province. It's a system that could be complementary to EMR functions, support other specialized rural patient groups, such as the priority groups outlined earlier in the presentation, and support clinical trial populations. How would we find ways that we can meet identified needs of your team, as well as potentially open up new healthcare services? So Frank, is this a, a, around equipment or or the the use of tracking equipment can be also used to track other healthcare services? I'm not sure Frank is still here right. or not. Where are you, Frank? Frank, Jim, you took so long to get to my question. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, okay, so the system uh, is. It's, it's kind of like an adjunct in EMR. It's like half in the world of EMR and it's half in the world of managing and tracking equipment. And it has the records for all the people in the province. And it's a distributed group and a distributed healthcare network. Like the, the, the people are out in the fields or they're, they run out of another hospital or, or whatever. So it seems to me that people, I'm, I know a lot about EMRs. I've developed the EMRs that Elizabeth's talking about and I know the pros and cons of it and I know how the data works and whatever. And it seems to me that half, that half the, the, the thing that's not being talked about is what you're, what you're solving these problems with. So I have a system that kind of works with what you're solving as well as tracking what you're fixing, like what the problem is. I'm not so focused so much on, on my system. It's like you, people here are talking about a lot of different problems that need to be solved. And I'm like, okay, so what's the pathway in to finding someone's problem that we can solve like i'm like okay i have a generic healthcare database that's based on 30 years of experience it covers a lot of the issues that elizabeth brings up it complies with ontario standards it's a working model it's running for five years out of kgh there's 40 people working off the system it's like it's it's good and we evolve it every week and i'm like well this is for rural people because it's for remote people I have no idea who I would approach. I have no idea how I would find out the different types of problems you're trying to solve. 
I have no idea how to get team members involved. I would not have no idea how somebody could fund the deployment of it, how you find, it's like, and I've been in the healthcare system for 35 years. I, I like, I recognize some of the people on this talk for having met them over the last 30 years. And I don't know where to go to, to, to build on the ideas you're uh, seeking to solve or the challenges you're seeking to solve. So can you tell me how I, who I talk to, where, where you're seeing us come forward, I, you know, just, I'm not looking for like, hand me a checklist, but I'm like, start the ball rolling. How do I start the ball rolling? Or how do I jump on your ball? <laughs> so our ball is just being born. Um, and, and it's, it's conversations like that, that, that help us in that maturity pathway. So the Ontario health team is literally a year old. Um, right. And, and we're learning as we go. So, so we have within our, uh, the way we've set it up, um, is we have what we call support structures where um, different aspects that transcend across the projects that we do, and it won't matter what projects we do. We know we need an evaluation support structure. We need a communications and engagement support structure. We need a finance and resource support structure. And we have a digital support structure of which Daniel co-chairs. And, um, and then we have the health home support structure, which is co -chair, which is chaired by another of our family doctors. And so, so those support structures um, are where we can bring in those ideas and, and then apply them to the, all of the projects or some of the projects. It's, it's really like the Ontario health team is, is two projects in one. One is one project is the individual priority groups that, that I outlined in that, but the bigger project um, is that of the team of itself? And how does it become an organization that will be accountable for the delivery of care to that attributable population? And that's the work of our support structures and our leadership tables um, that do that. So practically reaching out through, through Ali Summers or Miller Ali, our two digital project managers, um, myself as the executive lead can connect you to, if, it, if it's not digital, to, to, the, to the right groups. Um, and it, it's about starting these conversations and, and finding our way, you know, a, a year ago, we were at about 175 partners and now we're at about 300. So we're growing as we go, right. if that helps. So are you, are you saying, and are you implying that in terms of a next steps, just ad hoc, reach out to one of the three of you, your two digital assistants and yourself, yeah. and just say, I'd like to talk to people and you'll yeah, see and if there are the opportunities to start brainstorming ideas absolutely thanks and and maybe frank i could add on to that 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 you know i think you'll find increasingly there are events networking events um for example uh, you know associated with ddqic and and others and uh, especially as <clears throat> hopefully we keep moving to opening up more um there'll be opportunities that in that way as well and and certainly don't be afraid don't don't, don't hesitate to reach out to uh to DDQIC, for example, if uh, you want to get connected to the, the, the community that, that's connected to DDQIC and, and you know, there's co-working space, meeting space and things like that as well. Yeah, so, it's not uh, really about space. It's really about people like... For sure. Yeah. No, that makes that, that total sense. Jim, did you want to add? Uh, yeah, just add, add sort of another thought to the, the, the kind of the conundrum of which stakeholder can actually help out here. And... I guess I'm going to point to an example that quite a number of startups that uh, Jim's group and our group have been able to work with, and that is responding to the Department of Defense Challenges Program, where they've been very focused in saying, we're putting a call out for solutions to a very focused problem, and they make funding available to fund those solutions. And uh, you know, quite a few companies have uh, developed proof of concept and that would be a mechanism. I guess that would require the province spending money, but that would incentivize startups to say, well, okay, the government's willing to put some money towards this, then uh, we'll at least put the resources in to develop and stand up an initial solution to see if it's something that could be more, more broadly adopted. So I'd, I'd point to the Department of Defense as uh, uh, ch challenges ideas as maybe an interesting way to get very focused. And so it's not like you need to put out millions and millions of dollars, they can actually be very focused. And if you start getting results and you meet milestones, then you unlock more funding within the same program. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to jump now and it's partially related as well to, uh, to Blake Daly from Briere Hospital. Uh, in response to funding restrictions, do you have a team that is running innovation pilot projects 
that can demonstrate key performance indicators. Uh, the CAN Health Network may be a partner that you want to speak with. So any anybody want to comment on running innovation pilots? It's partially related to the discussion that we were just having. Uh, Kim, maybe put you on the spot. Yeah, so, for sure. No, so, go ahead. So I, yeah, I, I'd better do this one because the CAN Health Network, well, it's a network of hospitals and other health organizations, not just hospitals that are coming together to, um, I guess you would say, share questions of, that require innovative solutions and that um, co-funds pilots with Canadian tech companies to pilot the solution within one of the network member centers um, that could eventually lead to a request for proposals at the end of the day. So I think they're about, um, I know uh, somebody was just in the chat with me about this. Um, uh, yes, Lake Daly from Briere Hospital, which is a member of Can Health. And uh, Kingston Health Sciences, maybe it signed the paperwork. I don't know. I know Dave Pecora was on the line and Renata, maybe you can t update us, but we will be joining that network as well. And the, um, the idea is that not only do you come together around identifying potential innovative solutions or technologies to common problems, you have an opportunity to have a pilot with a Canadian technology company that could address that problem, um, be co-funded and use the outputs of that um, evaluation and the pilot to move ahead perhaps with a request for proposals. I don't know, Blake, you're on the line. I don't know whether I summarized it appropriately. Yeah, it bounced off of kind of what Frank was talking about, how this, it's kind of a nebulous access area for Canadian innovators, especially to get into the space. And then we buy everything from America when it comes at the end of the day for these large healthcare solutions. So the Can Health Network is trying to tackle both of those problems. The fact that we spend close to $300 billion a year in Canada on our healthcare, and that very few of those dollars are spent on um, innovations out of Canada. So the Can Health Network is really tackling this in a way that makes it accessible for Canadian health innovators to uh, access the hospitals. And uh, as, as a leading edge in that network, Breer Hospital in Ottawa with about a thousand beds across the city, uh, we really feel like the model has worked well. So something to explore for you and your team. Uh, and we, we'd, we'd love to chat and just swap notes if you're ever looking at it from the edge side. Thanks, thanks Blake. Elizabeth, did you have anything you want to add or Kim? No. No, but uh, no, it's wonderful to see that, that network emerging. Yeah, lots of talent stranded individually. So, and that's, you know, I mean, that's part of the reason why we're doing this series of workshops as well, KHSC and, and FLAOHT and, and so forth. So um, I would like to jump to Connie Glenn's question, which is expanding on the prevention and self-management discussion. Has there been consideration given to the provision of both therapeutic and preventative exercise, physical activity in a digital format? The ties in wearable, this sorry, this ties into wearable devices as previously mentioned. Anybody like to tackle that one? So really we're looking at, at, uh, at uh, exercise and uh, preventative, uh, sorry, preventative exercise, physical activity. I, I would totally agree. And similar to the, to the importance of, of nutrition, the importance of exercise and the importance of, of physical activity in, in people's health, I think really addresses that population health piece and the value of preventative care and, and also, you know, considering all of people's well-being, you know, we know the benefits of exercise and, and how can we embed in our health home and in our care delivery systems, the value of, of doing that and, and, you know, including that in the information that we share with, with people and, and the things that we promote as valuable. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Connie, you have your hand up. Would you like to uh, to join in? Um, yes, just because I, I kind of want to expand it a bit. I think exercise is often just thought of in the preventative sense, but it's, you know, it's a treatment in and of itself. Um, that's why we have exercise as medicine here in Canada. Uh, and I think one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is the exercise community who's doing therapeutic exercise, they're already in the, that digital realm. So I'm working with a, a company right now and you know, there's a program available 
where we can do remote monitoring of things like blood pressure, et cetera. So somebody can, you know, attach those devices. We know what's going on with them. And we can um, also check up on adherence to, you know, a prescribed program of exercise because they have to log in and do it. Um, and we can pre-populate you know, information and videos and other things for them so that they're able to continue to do that. Um, you know, in terms of cost containment in our system, uh, we're not utilizing physical activity enough for things like, you know, uh, doing prehabilitation uh, so that we know that the individual is going to recover then more quickly from that surgical intervention. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of people uh, in the situation of, you know, maybe their post cardiac rehab and they're coming out into the community and no, no access to a, an appropriate provider. Um, going off to your local gym doesn't cut it safety wise for a lot of these people. So that's why I'm asking, they, there's already digital things there and how can we, or who should I talk to about, how can we integrate that better here in this community? Cause I think it's a very underutilized sort of segment of healthcare. Thank you. Kim, or did you have, or Daniel, any, any additional uh, thoughts? I mean, I agree hundred uh, percent. I think probably, Kim, you just agree, reaching out to Ali with that information um, would be one of the next steps to get it kind of onto the agenda, but I agree something like that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Kim? And if I, yeah, I, I, I just a little bit, and I, and I think this is the, the OHT value where, whereas in individual silos, um, you know, primary care is funded and accountable for X. Hospitals are funded and accountable for Y. Home and community care is funded and accountable for Z. And there's no joint accountability of X, Y, and Z. So for things that, that we know have value, in order to encompass a, a program like yours, Connie, into, into, into our healthcare system and have it funded appropriately, um, you know, if we input, you know, this, this amount of resource to achieve more benefit, uh, unless we have shared accountability, there's no way to, to cover that. So I think the Ontario health teams provide that opportunity for that type of innovation in, in system transformation. So if we can agree that a hip surgery, it's almost like an expansion of bundled care, right? Hip surgeries are worth this. And now the primary care provider is going to do this and we're going to engage the nutrition people and we're going to engage the exercise people who are all going to contribute to this person's well-being and recovery before and after surgery because the outcome is going to be better. So the hospital physiotherapist doesn't have to do that much money and work and they're going to get out of hospital two days less. In shared accountability, we can address that and we can fund it and put the resources where they're best served. But we're not there yet, but we're going to be. We're going to be. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm mindful of the time closing down. I, I would just like to very quickly throw this one out and maybe invite, you know, sort of some very quick answers. Um, Dan asked about the potential for peer-to-peer -peer support. So, you know, I think you know, sort of building on the home, the home health um, idea. Um, do you see potential for peer support systems based in, is integrated into the, the health home community model? Any thoughts, anybody? Or? I mean, it would seem to me that, that you know, that, uh, that, so there's that connectedness thing. Dan, Daniel? Uh, so so I, I think certainly there's opportunities for all these programs. And I think that in a fully developed, mature OHT, that ideally as much self-management and peer support that we can provide our patients is really important. Because we know that <laughs> I tell my patients often that Hopefully you're spending less than 1% of your life with me in my office or at your home and you're spending 99% of your life doing other things. Um, so anything that increases that, uh, you know, shared accountability for one's health that provides the resources for patients to do the self-management or uh, collective management uh, can only benefit everyone because I can't be everywhere at once, nor can any healthcare provider. Uh, so I think all those types of innovations and projects and a mature OHT would be extremely valuable. 
Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Kim or Elizabeth, any any thoughts that you'd like to add or I'm about ready to take it home otherwise. Yeah. Elizabeth, um, go for it. it well, I, I think there have been out of necessity a move in that direction in some areas. I mean, I'm most familiar with the cancer space. And of course, there's been group support within the cancer community for a long time, but where it's moved into the more intervention or therapeutic is in the counseling space for, let's say, genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer. Used to be that you'd have to see a genetic counselor before you got the test done for all sorts of reasons. But when everyone was flooded with um, requests for appointment that no one could handle, the genetic counselor here and in many other places organized group genetic counseling classes that provided everyone with the same information and each other's questions, of course, elevated the discussion because people would ask questions that some hadn't thought of, but that were pertinent to them. So I think we are seeing movements in that direction. And of course, rehabilitation, sometimes there are classes and rehabilitation. We don't, we still sort of see the unit of healthcare to be an individual person plus their family caregivers with uh, the provider that they're seeing right now. And it's very hard to actually get the cluster of providers um, together that might want to see them. And similarly, hard to get everybody when privacy is an issue um, um, in a peer-to-peer -peer, um, setting. I'm, I'm talking more about group solutions to common problems. Um, and that isn't maybe what Dan meant exactly, but it's relevant because of course, the peer interaction in a group has um, some important effects on the nature of the interactions that the group as a whole is going through. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Kim or Dan, anything that you'd like to add to, to that? Okay. Um, then what I'd like to do is um, just provide the opportunity, uh, Kim, uh, Dan, and Elizabeth, if, do you have any sort of final closing words that you'd like to offer as we bring the session to a close? I have a few things I'll say at the very end. Uh, I'd also thank uh, the people that, that have helped us put this together. But but Kim, uh, perhaps if there's any closing words that you'd like to add. Well, I was going to thank all those people too, but you can do that. Well, you go for it if you'd like no, to. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's all good. No, I, no, I want to thank all of you for coming and, and the conversations and the discussions around different ways that, that we can, can address health and wellness and, and the important pieces thereof are are really where, where we can make a big difference and, and do it differently in a way that matters to, to our people and our providers and our population. Um, so, uh, you know, there've been lots of good ideas that I really please, please, please connect um, through Ali. Her, her email is, is in the chat there or it's on our website. Um, she is our connector of all connectors. Um, and the work that, that the innovation group does and that Elizabeth does is, is just so complimentary and the OHC just so looks forward to working with this community about, about ways to do it better. I wanna thank you all for your time. Thanks, thanks Kim. Dan, is there anything that you'd like to, uh, any closing words at all? I, I just wanna echo what Kim said, that it was a pleasure working with all of you, meeting all of you and uh, some really great ideas and conversation in the chat that we didn't get to today. Um, but it's, uh, we're still at the start of our journey. So I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities moving forward. I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you and please connect with Ali. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Elizabeth. You're good. Okay. Um, so, and, and, uh, Ben from Kingston Economic Development has put in a, a reminder that there is the Kingston Syracuse Pathway Cross Border Conference on Health Innovation, and that is on June seventh. So um, the the information is there, um, and uh, there's also a, a Build to Scale Health uh, Get to Know You session. And I'm going to ask Bruna if she could, uh, Bruna or Megan, just put that into the uh, into the chat as well. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to thank all the the people from the FLA OHT, from KHSC, uh, from DDQIC, and from St. Lawrence College, uh, who have helped uh, put this session together. It's been you know, really enjoyable working with you and looking forward to 
you know, continuing the momentum that uh, that we're building. Um, the, you know, I think one of the things that's emerged is so. First of all, hopefully you've got some some more ideas, or can see how ideas that you have can be evolved and where the opportunities might lie. Uh, hopefully you've left now with uh, some points of contact, Ali in particular. Um, but I do think that that to build on some of the points, for example, that Blake made and and, and others, Elizabeth. Um, you know, I, if we points of contact are one piece, but I think you know, changing our points of contact to more of a web or a network as well uh, in the region will be another important piece. And so, um, you know, I, I would be. I, I think you're going to see that we'll be trying to organize more events going forward. Hopefully, eventually, we're going to get to some in person as well. And you know, we can contemplate doing some, for example, in Kingston, but doing some. Um, uh, in in various parts of Frontenac County or in Lennox and Addington as well, right? We we don't need to limit ourselves to uh, to one location, um, and uh, have a chance for for people to connect, and then for people with similar ideas or seeing opportunities that they may collaborate on um, to build out ideas. The other thing is, please keep in mind that there are now you know through the Health Innovation YGK plus other kinds of incubator and accelerator programs around the region. Um, also um, uh, supports mentoring, access to small amounts of seed capital, co-working space, et cetera, um, that you can reach out to. We're also very happy to try to help connect you with people, for example, who might be associated with Queens doing research or at St. Lawrence College in the region. Um, so, you know, don't, don't think of it just about, you know, co-working, et cetera. It's, you know, can I find some interested people who might have an idea that could help and then we can connect and then we can help build that out and then mobilize it out. Okay, so I think there's lots of potential. We're just really getting started, but I think that the really encouraging thing you know, through the KHSC uh, workshops that we've had the two so far um, is you can now start to see the scale of what's going on and the scale of the opportunities. So let's keep building. And I'd like to thank um, our speakers, um, Dr. Uh, Morrison and, and uh, and uh, Dr. Glatt and uh, Dr. Eisenhower for uh, all your work and, and very thoughtful comments and uh, an overview that you provided. Thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for very engaging questions and discussion. And I hope that you found this helpful and interesting and we will be making this available on YouTube and um, making the slides available as well. Okay, so at that, I'd like to wrap it up.